Sigmund Freud was the famous founder of psychoanalysis and believed that refraining from sex provided mental and physical benefits. According to his biographer, Ernest Jones, and I quote, Freud held the opinion, based on personal experience and observation, that sexual activity was incompatible with the accomplishing of any great work. Since he felt that the great work of creating and establishing psychotherapy was his destiny, he told his wife that they could no longer engage in sexual relations. Indeed, from about age 40 until his death, Freud was absolutely celibate in order to, quote, sublimate the libido for creative purposes. Sir Isaac Newton, scientist and mathematician, was a lifelong celibate who was believed to have died a virgin. In a letter to philosopher John Locke, he writes, and I quote, the way to chastity is not to struggle with incontinent thoughts, but to avert the thoughts by some employment or by reading or by meditating on other things. According to this BBC article, Nikola Tesla, legendary scientist and inventor, quote, believed that celibacy spurred on the brain. Mahatma Gandhi, freedom fighter, said, and I quote, We have considered how to keep good health on what it depends and how to conserve it. If all men always followed the rules of health and observed unbroken celibacy, the chapters of this book that follow would not be necessary because such men cannot possibly suffer any physical or mental illness. Michelangelo's contemporary, Asano Candivi, who was also his biographer, described Michelangelo as having, quote, monk-like chastity. Pythagoras, philosopher and mathematician. Pythagoras himself established a small community that set a premium on study, vegetarianism, and sexual restraint or abstinence. Later philosophers believed that celibacy would be conducive to the detachment and equilibrium required by the philosopher's calling. And what of the Greek philosopher Plato? Plato's dialogue stresses the intellect over the physical because of the risk of slavish dependence on physical desires. In this context, Plato recommends reduced erotic engagement to better exercise and control the mind. In other words, Sexual activity is only detrimental, only insofar as it distracts from intellectual endeavors. Plato praises this exemplary self-control, citing a famous athlete who had possessed in his soul such art and such courage, mixed with moderation, that he never touched a woman, or boy for that matter, during the entire time of his training. Plato suggests that by consciously choosing to control sexual desires, an individual liberates the mind to better study virtue. The Greek philosopher Socrates first prescribes abstinence from sexual pleasure. A conventionalized treatment of his view on sex then follows, which illustrates and amplifies the earlier summary treatment of its dangers. Xenophon makes the wrong move and finds that though sex may be a pleasure, it makes you a slave. The Dalai Lama, spiritual leader of Tibet, once said, and I quote, Sexual pleasure, sexual desire, actually, I think is short period satisfaction and, often, that leads to more complication.
following excerpt is from chapter 11 of a book authored by Napoleon Hill called Think and Grow Rich about the transmutation of sex energy. Sex transmutation is simple and easily explained. It means the switching of the mind from thoughts of physical expression to thoughts of some other nature. Sex desire is the most powerful of human desires. When driven by this desire, men develop keenness of imagination, courage, willpower, persistence, and creative ability unknown to them at other times. So strong and impelling is the desire for sexual contact that men freely run the risk of life and reputation to indulge it. When harnessed and redirected along other lines, this motivating force maintains all of its attributes of keenness of imagination, courage, etc., which may be used as powerful creative forces in literature, art, or any other profession or calling, including, of course, the accumulation of riches. The transmutation of sexual energy calls for the exercise of willpower, to be sure, but the reward is worth the effort. The desire for sexual expression is inborn and natural. The desire cannot and should not be submerged or eliminated, but it should be given an outlet through forms of expression which enrich the body, mind, and spirit of man. If not given this form of outlet, through transmutation, it will seek outlets through purely physical channels. A river may be dammed and its water controlled for a time, but eventually it will force an outlet. The same is true of the emotion of sex. It may be submerged and controlled for a time, but its very nature causes it to be ever-seeking means of expression. If it is not transmuted into some creative effort, it will find a less worthy outlet. Fortunate, indeed, is the person who has discovered how to give sex emotion an outlet through some form of creative effort, for he has, by that discovery, lifted himself to the status of a genius. The men of greatest achievement are men with highly developed sex natures, men who have learned the art of sex transmutation. The men who have accumulated great fortunes and achieved outstanding recognition in literature, art, industry, architecture, and the professions were motivated by the influence of a woman. When driven by this emotion, men become gifted with a superpower for action. Understand this truth, and you will catch the significance of the statement that sex transmutation will lift one to the status of a genius. The emotion of sex contains the secret of creative ability. The desire for sex expression comes at the head of the list of stimuli which most effectively step up the vibrations of the mind and start the wheels of physical action. But the emotion of sex is by great odds the most intense and powerful of all mind stimuli. Transmutation of sex energy may lift one to the status of a genius. A man who has discovered how to increase the vibrations of thought to the point where he can freely communicate with sources of knowledge not available through the ordinary rate of vibration of thought. Are there known sources of knowledge which are available only to genii? And if so, what are these sources, and exactly how may they be reached? Genius is developed through the sixth sense. The reality of the sixth sense has been fairly well established. This sixth sense is creative imagination. The faculty of creative imagination is one which the majority of people never use during an entire lifetime, and if used at all, it usually happens by mere accident. A relatively small number of people use, with deliberation and purpose of forethought, the faculty of creative imagination. The faculty of creative imagination is the direct link between the finite mind of man and infinite intelligence. All so-called revelations referred to in the realm of religion, and all discoveries of basic or new principles in the field of invention, take place through the faculty of creative imagination. The creative imagination functions best when the mind is vibrating due to some form of mind stimulation at an exceedingly high rate, that is, when the mind is functioning at a rate of vibration higher than that of ordinary normal thought. When brain action has been stimulated, it has the effect of lifting the individual far above the horizon of ordinary thought. When lifted to this higher level of thought, through any form of mind stimulation, an individual occupies, relatively, the same position as one who has ascended in an airplane to a height from which he may see over and beyond the horizon line, which limits his vision while on the ground. 
Moreover, while on this higher level of thought, the individual is not hampered or bound by any of the stimuli which circumscribe and limit his vision while wrestling with the problems of gaining the three basic necessities of food, clothing, and shelter. He is in a world of thought in which the ordinary workaday thoughts have been as effectively removed as are the hills and valleys and other limitations of physical vision when he rises in an airplane. While on this exalted plane of thought, the creative faculty of the mind is given freedom for action. The way has been cleared for the sixth sense to function. It becomes receptive to ideas which could not reach the individual under any other circumstances. The sixth sense is the faculty which marks the difference between a genius and an ordinary individual. The creative faculty becomes more alert and receptive to vibrations originating outside the individual's subconscious mind. The more this faculty is used and the more the individual relies upon it and makes demands upon it for thought impulses. This faculty can be cultivated and developed only through use. That which is known as one's conscious operates entirely through the faculty of the sixth sense. The great artists, writers, musicians, and poets become great because they acquire the habit of relying upon the still small voice which speaks from within through the faculty of creative imagination. The method by which he does this varies with the individual, but this is the sum and substance of his procedure. He stimulates his mind so that it vibrates on a higher than average plane. He concentrates upon the known factors the finished part of his invention and creates in his mind a perfect picture of unknown factors the unfinished part of his invention he holds this picture in his mind until it has been taken over by the subconscious mind then relaxes by clearing his mind of all thought and waits for his answers to flash into his mind sometimes the results are both definite and immediate at other times the results are negative depending upon the state of development of the sixth sense or creative faculty the human mind responds to stimulation. Among the greatest and most powerful of these stimuli is the urge of sex. When harnessed and transmuted, this driving force is capable of lifting men into that higher sphere of thought which enables them to master the sources of worry and petty annoyance which beset their pathway on the lower plane. Chief among the stimuli with which this stepping up of the vibrations may be produced is sex energy. The mere possession of this energy is not sufficient to produce a genius. The energy must be transmuted from desire for physical contact into some other form of desire and action before it will lift one to the status of a genius. Far from becoming genii, because of great sex desires, the majority of men lower themselves through misunderstanding and misuse of this great force to the status of the lower animals. A mind stimulant is any influence which will either temporarily or permanently increase the vibrations of thought. Nature has prepared her own potions with which men may safely stimulate their minds so they vibrate on a plane that enables them to tune in to fine and rare thoughts which come from no man knows where. No satisfactory substitute for nature's stimulants has ever been found. It is a fact well known to psychologists that there is a very close relationship between sex desires and spiritual urges, a fact which accounts for the peculiar behavior of people who participate in the orgies known as religious revivals. Through these sources one may commune with an infinite intelligence or enter at will the storehouse of the subconscious mind, either one's own or that of another person, a procedure which is all there is of genius. That the factor of personality known as personal magnetism is nothing more or less than sex energy. Highly sexed people always have a plentiful supply of magnetism. Through cultivation and understanding, this vital force may be drawn upon and used to great advantage in the relationships between people. Transmutation of sex energy calls for more willpower than the average person cares to use for this purpose. Those who find it difficult to summon willpower sufficient for transmutation may gradually acquire this ability. Though this requires willpower, the reward for the practice is more than worth the effort. These statements of the virtue of sex energy should not be construed as justification for the libertine. The emotion of sex is a virtue only when used intelligently and with discrimination. 
it may be misused and often is to such an extent that it debases instead of enriches both body and mind intemperance in sex habits is just as detrimental as intemperance in habits of drinking and eating no man can avail himself of the forces of his creative imagination while dissipating them sex alone is a mighty urge to action but its forces are like a cyclone they are often uncontrollable when the emotion of love begins to mix itself with the emotion of sex the result is calmness of purpose poise accuracy of judgment and balance when driven by his desire to please a woman based solely upon the emotion of sex a man may be and usually is capable of great achievement but his actions may be disorganized distorted and totally destructive when driven by his desire to please a woman based upon the motive of sex alone a man may steal cheat and even commit murder but when the emotion of love is mixed with the emotion of sex that same man will guide his actions with more sanity balance and reason criminologists have discovered that the most hardened criminals can be reformed through the influence of a woman's love there is no record of a criminal having been reformed solely through the sex influence love romance and sex are all emotions capable of driving men to heights of super achievement love is the emotion which serves as a safety valve and ensures balance poise and constructive effort when combined these three emotions may lift one to an altitude of a genius the emotion of love brings out and develops the artistic and aesthetic nature of man it leaves its impress upon one's very soul even after the fire has been subdued by time and circumstance memories of love never pass they linger guide and influence long after the source of stimulation has faded there is nothing new in this every person who has been moved by genuine love knows that it leaves enduring traces upon the human heart the effect of love endures because love is spiritual in nature even the memories of love are sufficient to lift one to a higher plane of creative effort the major force of love may spend itself and pass away like a fire which has burned itself out but it leaves behind indelible marks as evidence that it has passed that way its departure often prepares the human heart for a still greater love go back into your yesteryears at times and bathe your mind in the beautiful memories of past love it will soften the influence of the present worries and annoyances it will give you a source of escape from the unpleasant realities of life and maybe who knows your mind will yield to you during this temporary retreat into the world of fantasy ideas or plans which may change the entire financial or spiritual status of your life if you believe yourself unfortunate because you have loved and lost perish the thought one who has loved truly can never lose entirely love is whimsical and temperamental its nature is ephemeral and transitory it comes when it pleases and goes away without warning accept and enjoy it while it remains but spend no time worrying about its departure worry will never bring it back dismiss also the thought that love never comes but once love may come and go times without number but there are no two love experiences which affect one in just the same way there may be and there usually is one love experience which leaves a deeper imprint on the heart than all the others but all love experiences are beneficial except to the person who becomes resentful and cynical when love makes its departure there should be no disappointment over love and there would be none if people understood the difference between the emotions of love and sex the major difference is that love is spiritual while sex is biological no experience which touches the human heart with a spiritual force can possibly be harmful except through ignorance or jealousy love is without question life's greatest experience it brings one into communication with infinite intelligence when mixed with the emotions of romance and sex it may lead one far up the ladder of creative effort marriages not blessed with the eternal affinity of love properly balanced and proportioned with sex cannot be happy ones and seldom endure love alone will not bring happiness in marriage nor will sex alone when these two beautiful emotions are blended marriage may bring about a state of mind closest to the spiritual that one may ever know on this earthly plane when the emotion of romance is added to those of love and sex 
the obstructions between the finite mind of man and infinite intelligence are removed. The woman who understands man's nature and tactfully caters to it need have no fear of competition from other women. Men may be giants with indomitable willpower when dealing with other men, but they are easily managed by the woman of their choice. Most men will not admit that they are easily influenced by the women they prefer because it is in the nature of the male to want to be recognized as the stronger of the species. Moreover, the intelligent woman recognizes this manly trait and very wisely makes no issue of it. Some men know that they are being influenced by the women of their choice, but they tactfully refrain from rebelling against the influence because they are intelligent enough to know that no man is happy or complete without the modifying influence of the right woman. The man who does not recognize this important truth deprives himself of the power which has done more to help men achieve success than all other forces combined. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an independent anthropologist. Please check out my books available on Amazon.com. I'd like to thank those of you who support these presentations by sharing them I rely on word of mouth. Please don't forget to leave a comment. Have a wonderful weekend and I will see you next time.